Hello all. I welcome you all to the eighth lecture in this course, E six ninety idiom. The last time we met, we spoke about uh, crystal growth. We we spoke about methods to grow three uh, D lattices from melt. We spoke about different methods to grow two D nano structures, one D nano rods, and quantum dots and such. And today we will uh, dive a little bit deeper to understand. various crystals lattices and primarily electrons and its wave function in periodic potentials right? so in any uh, practical solids it's impossible to solve the problem accurately because of the degrees of freedom that you have let's say uh, any one mode has about um, avogadro number in 10 to the power 23 atoms and typically they have three degrees of translational freedom probably one vibrational and rotational freedom right so basically 3 to 5 uh, degrees of freedom that you might have for any particle and that multiplied by the total number of particles give you insanely large number of degrees of freedom which we cannot solve accurately so under these situations you will be turn to symmetry to simplify the problem for us the most simplest symmetry symmetry operations can be listed as follows translation which says that if i move along particular directions given by these vectors a1 a2 and a3 we will see that the atomic arrangements and physical properties potentials remains invariant what we mean is let us say that we are at this particular point here and then we step in direction a1 vector for a unit length right and then we land to this atom here the atomic arrangement remains the same you don't have to go only in one direction you can take any direction r which is called as a lattice vector which is a combination of three unit vectors if it's a three dimensional lattice it will be only one vector if it's one dimensional lattice you can look at it in many ways each of these vectors are called as basis vectors for this lattice we will soon see what they mean they are also called as lattice vectors or real space vectors and so on and so forth there are different names for this so the invariant atomic arrangements as you do translational motion in three dimensions is called as the translational symmetry the second one is the rotational symmetry it it, it is typically mentioned in folds so what we mean is let us say that we are at this particular point and then rotate the way in which we see by 90 degrees okay let's say we do it in counter clockwise direction and i see i stand here and see in this direction right so let's say there is another atom here so if i'm seeing from here i get an atom at some distance d while i see from this direction i get an atom to my right hand side to a distance lesser than d right so basically i do not have rotational symmetry in this particular lattice if i rotate by 90 degrees whereas if i rotate by 180 degrees obviously i see let's say i start seeing from here once again on the right i can see an atom at distance d right so you have rotational symmetry so the number of folds tells you at what angles i can rotate and then still have same atomic arrangements similar arguments can be said for inversion reflection about a plane and identity this comes from group theory and particularly the mathematics of set and identity the act of doing nothing is also included in this but for the purpose of today's lecture we'll talk specifically about translational symmetry any of these symmetry of course just tells you what sort of degeneracy what sort of constant energies what sort of constant wave vector energy relationship that we will have later on we can talk about how other symmetry operations uh, enforced enforced strict regulations on um, on electron wave vectors and their energies we can see that later on but for now let's just talk about only translational symmetry so what we mean is any function f defined at a point r if i translate uh, this r by a lattice vector capital r small r is any small uh, three dimensional uh, position if i translate that position by a lattice vector the function should remain the same so what we mean is let us say the same kind of arrangement i take let's say from this point an r here if i translate this by one lattice vector let us say 
if I translate it to here, if I take a look at this, the function at this particular R should be same as the function if it is defined at this R plus capital R. The function, the function should remain, remain the same in magnitude as well as in direction. Okay. Now, the, the rotational invariance or translational invariance, typically what we do is we define an area which remains invariant. The smallest area which, we, which remains invariant upon translation, we call it as a unit cell. The unit cell does not have to be uniquely defined. For instance, if we take a look at uh, this lattice structure here, the unit cell can be defined in many ways. The easiest way is to define points here. The parallel pivot shown here gives you a unit cell, right? And you can also define another unit cell by drawing perpendicular bisectors to vectors joining these lattice points. Remember, any all of these things are called as lattice point and each lattice point we add some group of atoms right this is called as motif right now we are only talking about the lattice point so it is only these things which matter lattice points are mathematical constructs when you put a lattice point when you put a motif on a lattice point you get an atomic arrangement okay so we have several vectors joining different lattice points and if we draw the perpendicular bisectors, we get a region enclosed by these perpendicular bisectors. This region or this unit cell is called as a beginner seed cell. The, uh, the normal way to, uh, to define a unit cell like this parallel pipette is called as a bravi lattice. You have a bravi lattice if you have each unit cell has only one, not atom, but lattice point. If each unit cell has only one lattice point, you have you get a Bravais lattice. The beginner seed cell is a way of defining it, defining a lattice unit cell such that you have only one lattice point. So a beginner seed cell is also a Bravais lattice. There is a way to define this beginner seeds by drawing perpendicular bisectors. This will ensure that you will have only one lattice point inside or enclosed by this area. Okay. We will not go into details of this system because this is something that we have seen previously. We'll just rush through the various commonly known lattice systems. The simplest being uh, the simple cube as clearly mentioned in the name itself. It has three lattice vectors, A, B, and C. Each one of them perpendicular to each other, having the same magnitude. If you take a simple cube and put an atom at the center of this uh, cube, then you get a body-centered one. Obviously, the unit cell, if you define the unit cell as the cube, the body-centered one um, is not a Bravi lattice, right? Because you have another lattice point at the center of this volume. There's a different way to define this. So if you define vectors starting from the edge of this unit cell to the body center and do this to another body center here, you get another Bravi lattice. Now it's not a cube, but a parallel pivot, right? common metals like uh, iron, potassium, uh, crystallize in this form. The most common one is a face-centered cube. We take a cubic lattice and then add a lattice point each one of these face, face, right? So this is a cubic lattice, unit cell, cubic, simple cube, and then add to its each one of these face a lattice point. Once again, there are different ways to define this. So which is here pointed here by, let's say, having north, west, uh, uh, south, east, top and bottom. These are the different phases in addition to the simple cube lattice points. The unit vectors for this can be defined in this particular fashion. I'm not going into the details. You must have seen this either in the 614 or in other courses that you would have taken. Uh, many metals like uh, gold, silver, copper, all of them crystallize in this particular structure. Till now, we have talked about the uh, uh, crystal lattices whose unit vectors were perpendicular to each other. Here we have an hexagonal lattice where the unit cells are not, I mean, two unit vectors are not perpendicular but are at 90 degrees, and the third vector is perpendicular to both of them. So this is an hexagonal close, it's a hexagonal lattice. And if you add a lattice point to the center of this, you get an hexagonal closed pack system. The most common or the uh, simplest. Uh, I mean, uh, the most commonly observed structure 
for semiconductors is an FCC with a motif. What do we mean is we take an FCC and at each point we add an additional atom. So here we are not adding lattice points from in the previous places we were adding lattice points. Here we take an FCC and do not add a lattice point but just add an atom to each lattice point. So each lattice point instead of having one single atom now has uh, an atom which is offset by one fourth of the lattice constant in each direction. Right? For instance, in the previous example that we saw, we saw this uh, sort of an hexagonal lattice arrangement. And at each lattice point, you saw that we had three atoms, right? Now, instead of that, an FCC has at each point an atom which is offset by one fourth of the lattice constant in each dimension, right? So, Common semiconductors like silicon, germanium, and diamond uh, crystallize in this form. Uh, it is also called as zinc blend or diamond structure. Right. So, with this basic introduction to crystal lattices and structure, let's go back and look at periodicity. Right. Because eventually, why we introduce the crystals and structures is to see, or is to tell that the atoms in lattice are arranged in a periodic fashion. And the periodicity was defined by the lattice constants as we saw previously. But to solve a problem or to find the wave vectors of, a, of an electron in a lattice, we have to solve the potential problem, right? So we have to see how the potential varies in a lattice. For that, let us look at periodicity of a potential in one dimensional space. Let us take, for example, that if you have a potential which look like this, some concentric circles, so like something which has constant energies here, right? I take a, I take a snapshot like this, and then draw the potential. The potential kind of looks like this. This is the x direction. This is the potential. You can see that the potential repeats itself in space in one dimension, right? It has some crazy structure at each point, but if you translate and uh, a constant vector, let's say L along the x direction, I get the same potential value at all points in x. So this continues infinitely towards positive infinity in this direction and towards negative infinity in the other direction. Right? And whenever we have such periodic functions, we know how to represent it using Fourier series. And we represent it using this particular equation. f of x given a summation of, uh, of several exponentials. And the contribution of these exponentials is introduced by this coefficient EAN. To just simplify, I'll give you some example. Let us say that if the, uh, if the, if the periodic potential is a very simple sinusoid as shown here, right? So this is the most simplest. You can see that you will have only one term to explain this complete periodicity, which is the frequency of its, uh, um, of this oscillation in real space. Let's say this guy has a has a has a length L, then it will have a frequency 2 pi by L. And it will have only component only from this because it is a pure sinusoid. If it, if I start disturbing this sinusoid and then have something like this, here I have certain places where the potential is absent, then I start getting contributions from several frequency terms. So this plot, the plot on the right hand side is called as the Fourier space plot and this is the real space. The Fourier space tells you what are all the frequencies which contribute to a potential like this in the real space, right? And what we mean is if something has a periodicity or a frequency, let's say that you have a real space uh, potential whose frequency is say f, the Fourier space can have f and several other components contributing to this periodicity, right? So the frequency here, the, the x-axis in this Fourier space is given by g, and this g is defined by 2 pi n by l, n is an integer, l is the lattice constant, so it obviously has a units of one by centimeter, this is called a spatial frequency. You must have seen this in, uh, in uh, your in, uh, undergrad courses on uh, Fourier series and Fourier transforms and such. So this G is a frequency 
uh, representation for a time domain function as given here. So this is a simplification of this. Now, we know if we substitute this uh, Fourier expansion into the translational symmetry equation that we have here, we will get the, uh, the relation for G, for G. So what we mean is what all frequencies can contribute for a Fourier series, Fourier series term of a periodic potential in real space. That's the question that we want to ask. Right? So let's say that I have a function in real space having some frequency f. What are all the frequency components that I will have in f? It is periodic. That's the only thing that I tell you with a frequency f. Right? So to solve this, if I put this translational symmetry equation into this, I get this equation which is one of the most important equations of this of the solid state physics. Though it seems to be very trivial in one dimension, it turns out to be e power i g dot l equal to one, <clears throat> which tells me l is the wavelength in uh, in real space, right? So this is the frequency. This is a wavelength, so the frequency is two pi by l. So what it means, all the frequency components which will contribute to the Fourier series is 2 pi into some integer by L. So this, so this is mod A1 is actually equal to L. So what it is, is all the, so basically G's can have 2 pi into some integer by L. So what it means is I will have all the harmonics of the frequency in the real space. So this G can have all the harmonic components, that is the frequency of the, uh, of the periodicity in real space and its integer multiples. All of them can contribute to the Fourier series of that particular function, right? So this is in one dimension. Let's look at what happens if you extend the same argument to three dimensions, right? So let's say instead of F of X, now it's R, R is a triplet, right? It has R1, R2, and R3 in three dimensions. See, this is intercept along X axis, intercept along Y axis, intercepts along the Z axis. Again, this capital R is the periodicity in the, uh, the three dimensional space. L1 along A, A, A vector, L2 along B vector, and L3 along the uh, C vector or the third dimension, right? So the Fourier series can once again be written like this. If you have to enforce periodicity in the real space, it has to follow this expression e power i g dot r equal to 1. Now let's see how to find g's in the in the three dimension, right? So in one dimension, what we say is if f is the real space periodicity, your g can have f's and its harmonics. Right? That's what we that's what we, we saw previously. If f is if you have a periodic function in the real space, right? Now, what happens if it's in three dimension? How do we solve this simply? This is where we come to the reciprocal lattice. So while in the in one dimension, it seems to be simple, in three dimension, things appear to be slightly complicated, but it is not as complicated, okay? So now let us again look at uh, a real space uh, 2D structure here. So let's say this is L1 and this is L2 and we have taken it such, than, such that L1 is greater than L2, okay, something like this. And the equation that we have to solve is e power i g dot r equal to 1. How do we solve this? g is a triplet, right, because it has three, so this is the reciprocal space. Again, in reciprocal space, it, is, it has three dimensions. The real space has three dimensions. So basically, it has g1, g2, and g3. And R has L1, L2, and L3, right? So it has, again, um, three components here. If I multiply, obviously, I will have nine terms. And it's not simple to enforce this equation. So what do we do is to, to ensure that this equation remains true, we do something clever. We take the, the reciprocal lattice vectors such that G dot R will have only three components. So for reducing G of R from nine terms to three terms, we define three reciprocal lattice vectors, B1, B2, and B3, such that 
B1 is perpendicular to A2 and A3. B2 is perpendicular to A1 and A3. And B3 is perpendicular to A1 and A2. Right? If that is true, if you see, then if I multiply this equation, then these two will turn to zero. Then these two will turn to zero. This is the second term. In the third term, these two will turn to zero because of the definition of B1 and B2 and B3. Right? So we will have only three terms. And if we take this BIs such a such a fact that its magnitude is inverse of a1 then we can actually get this g dot r to be equal to some integer into 2 pi this is the reason why we choose to have reciprocal lattice vectors to be defined in this particular format to ensure that g dot r is equal to 1 what we are finally trying to come at is let's say this uh, yellow shaded region is the reciprocal space right and each of these thing, each of these dots here can represent any frequency. And these black dots here are the reciprocal lattice vectors. You can see that they are far and few in comparison to the yellow dots, right? All we are trying to say is the, the periodic function or the potential in the real space, which represents atom, can be represented by Fourier series whose components only have these black dots and none of these yellow dots. So if I take any G vector, which is a reciprocal lattice vector, then it will contribute to the Fourier series expansion of the real space. So this is something that I would like to take, I'd like you to take from you. If any K in Fourier space can be represented by a reciprocal lattice vector, then they contribute to the Fourier series of the real space lattice. This is the definition of a reciprocal lattice vector, right? So I would just reiterate here, the reciprocal lattice can have several values. The frequencies in reciprocal lattice is infinity, right? And a very small set of these points are the reciprocal lattice vectors. And any of these points will, be, will contribute to the Fourier series expansion of the real space lattice. Right, we will soon see what these frequencies represent, what is its wavelength, and how do we see how do we compare all the other frequencies in the reciprocal space and the reciprocal lattice vectors, and all these things we we'll compare as we go through in this uh, lecture. So, the reciprocal lattice have a few important properties, these are things which you have seen previously. Any vector in the reciprocal lattice is normal to a set of lattice planes, this is something which comes out mathematically. The volume represented by the reciprocal lattice is inversely proportional to the volume of the real space lattice. This is something that you will prove in your homework and this is also very straightforward. This is covered in most books. The reciprocal lattice is a reciprocal of, the reciprocal of the reciprocal lattice is a real space lattice in the sense that if you invert the reciprocal lattice, you will again get the real space lattice. Now that the reciprocal, let's say, let's say this is your reciprocal lattice vector. Okay, forget all the dots, forget the atoms. The reciprocal lattice does not have any atoms, right? So let's say this is a reciprocal lattice vector, G, right? And if I draw the bigness seed cell in the reciprocal space, the area enclosed by this bigness seed cell is called as a brillium zone. Okay, And the reciprocal lattice is particularly important for quantum mechanics because this is in the K space, right? Frequency space. And in quantum mechanics, H cross K means momentum, right? So we will soon see that the K values cannot be infinitely continuous. It has to be discrete. We will show that the K has a relationship to energy, which we, 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 which we know right, from a free electron dispersion. And we will also show that there will be an existence of a gap at certain k values. Certain k values are not allowed to have uh, propagating uh, waves. It can only sustain standing waves and such. So we will show all these things. So that's why reciprocal lattice has a special place when we talk about quantum mechanics. And that's why we deal with this in, uh, in particular detail in this lecture. Now that we spoke about reciprocal lattices and such, let's talk about an electron in a periodic potential, right? So let us take 
two um, atoms in a lattice. Let's call this zero, and let's call this at some point R. It does not have to be a neighbor. It, it can be any lattice translation, right? It can be like this. There is another R here. So something like this is also R. So this is some R1. All of these things are Ri's, right? And we know the Hamiltonian can be described by minus h bar square by 2m del square plus v. And we have taken this v potential to be periodic, right? If the potential is periodic and the electrons are all similar, the atomic arrangements are all similar, then you can clearly see the Hamiltonian should also be periodic. So what we mean is the Hamiltonian at any point R should be same as the Hamiltonian at point R plus capital R because all the potentials and the energies we say are uh, periodic, right? This, this, that is the definition of this lattice. If this is true, right? The Hamiltonian acting at point zero, so th this H acting on zero will give you some energy and zero, correct? Similarly, this H acting at, uh, at R, should give E and R. But then this is H naught, Hamiltonian at zero, and this is Hamiltonian at R. But we just proved that Hamiltonian at zero and R are one and the same, right? So here, the Hamiltonian acting on any point in the reciprocal lattice Ri, having a wave function Ri should be E, should give E the energy and Ri, right? So this is the Schrodinger's equation. And we just now showed that h of r should be equal to h of zero. So Hamiltonian at zero acting on ri gives you E and ri, right? So this is also a Schrodinger's equation, which tells you that ri is an eigenvector at point zero as well. So the ri, so this is the wave function ri, okay? So we are saying the wave function ri is also a solution at point zero. This is basically wave function Ri. And it also, it's not just that, it also has the same energy. And these Ri's are infinite. Right? The very fact that your Hamiltonian is periodic just tells you that you have infinitely many wave functions, infinitely many eigenvectors with the same eigenvalue E. So this is what these two equations tell you. However, the infinitely many equations, infinitely many solutions is not a problem for us. There's something that we have, all, we have always seen, right? So you have infinitely many plane waves, which are all solutions. But here, all the wave vectors have the same eigenvalue, and that's impossible. The only way to have it is each of these wave vectors, Ri's, are just a scaled version of the same uh, wave vector at zero. All I'm trying to say is, if I have a solution, the blue line is a solution at zero, each of these Ri's are just some scaled version of zero. And if I can show that if we take the scaled version lambda to be a complex number such as e power i theta, we can show that the bracket will always be the same, right? Because this lambda is a complex value lambda cross lambda will always be equal to one. And this is what we take here. We take lambda to be e power i psi and the lambda square will now always be equal to one, correct? So how do we do this? We take this lambda to be like e power i k dot r and this k is the momentum of the wave function here. So this is another plane wave e power i k r. This k is some any k, right? So what we mean is for any wave function zero, which satisfies the Schrodinger equation, there exists a reciprocal lattice vector K such that the translation by <coughs> real space lattice R is equivalent to multiplying the wave function by a phase factor e power i k dot R. So if there is exists, if there exists a solution to a wave function to, a, to the Hamiltonian psi k of R, the solution at any lattice translation R is just a multiplication of the phase factor e power i k dot R. And this is the block, Bloch's theorem. And this will be used over and again in many places. 
but the soul but the what it is saying is very simple let's see here so let's say if this is zero and i have a solution which is a pure sinusoid all we are saying is if i move to a point r we get the same solution but it is just phase shifted what is phase shifting instead of starting at zero i start at a different point but the magnitude remains the same right so i just phase shift it and the amount of phase shift depends upon the phase value e power i k dot r right so let's say the free electron solutions of a traveling wave is e power i k dot r and in a periodic potential let's say the periodic let's say uh let's say the periodic potential what it does is it just modulates the plane wave so e power i k dot r is the free electron solution this is a free electron solution and in a periodic lattice all i am saying is you modulate the free electron solution by some function u k of r right now we don't know the form of this u k of r okay i am just saying let me assume a solution for an electron in a periodic potential this is assuming a solution for an electron in periodic potential if i assume it this right like it is just the plane wave but then modulated by this function which depends upon the momentum let's say we say like this right and we know by block theorem that if i take this solution and then translate it by a reciprocal lattice vector k all i have to do is to multiply it by that value right so u k r plus capital r i'm just substituting r plus capital r in this equation i get this and from block equation u k r plus r is basically the same function that i have written here right it comes here multiplied by the phase factor e power i k dot r right so what we what these two equations will show is that your u k the potential the modulating what what modulates your free electron solution right is periodic Okay, so u k of r, the modulating thing should also be have should also have the periodicity of your lattice. So u k of r is u k of small r plus capital R. So this is a different way of just expressing the same statement that we said before. So the Bloch's theorem can be said in two ways. First is if you know a solution psi of r at any point, psi k of r at any point. the lattice translation psi k of r plus capital r is just e power i small k dot capital r into psi k of r this is the first way of writing the block equation second if you write an electron wave function to be a free electron wave <coughs> modulated by some function r whatever function b right what block's theorem says is this function u of r is also periodic right so these are two different ways of expressing the block theorem now let us uh, go and look at various solutions of um, let's say the um, of electron in a periodic potential right so we were talking about psi k to be e power i k dot r and what are what are these k's k's are the special frequencies right so they are they exist in this reciprocal space if k is a very so this is zero if k is a very small value mentioned by this blue dot here right its wavelength is really really large it can span several atomic distances right so this is one atomic distance second atomic distance so the wave represented by e power i k dot r for k values very small is a really large wavelength wave right so it has this blue shape if the k value is closer to this brillouin zone value so this is the first reciprocal lattice point the red one is very close to the reciprocal lattice point its wavelength will be very close to the interatomic distance right it's it's easy to see let's take in one dimension this is e power i k x right and if k is 2 pi by the reciprocal lattice vector l1 this is equal to the 
uh, reciprocal lattice vector, right? Two pi by L one. If it is so small, then the wavelength is L one, right? It is two pi. So the red line here shows a wave whose wavelength is similar to the interatomic space. So if the k values are closer to the reciprocal lattice vectors, then you have waves whose wavelength is close to the interatomic space. Right. So this is something that you have to keep in mind. This is the um, this is a translation between the k space and the real space. Now let's look at the black dot here, whose k value is even larger than the reciprocal lattice vector. Right, so in that case, the wavelength is now much smaller than the interatomic space. You have something like the red, like the black curve here. So what happens under these situations? Let's take a let's take a value of k which is larger than the reciprocal lattice here by an extent k prime. So I write k is g plus k prime, right? And g is any reciprocal lattice vector. Now if I substitute it into the Bloch's equation, psi of r. Once again, this wave vector should also be periodic, right? Psi k of r plus uh, capital R. And now I substitute uh, the Bloch's equation. So psi k of r plus capital R is the phase factor multiplied by psi k of r. And the phase factor is uh, this k, if I substitute this equation, g plus k prime, I get e power i g plus k prime dot r into psi k of r. And I know e power i g dot r is equal to 1. Right? This is the definition of the reciprocal lattice vector. Right? Because this is 1, what finally matters is I take this, um, this black wave whose k vector is larger than the first brillion zone, is larger than the first reciprocal lattice vector. What it finally tells us is it is just multiplied by a phase factor which gives you only the separation from the first brillion zone. The phase factor, so I take this and then translate it to the next reciprocal lattice vector, right? What really changes as you go from one lattice vector to the other lattice vector is just the power i k prime dot r. It is not the actual value, right? So any vector whose k value is larger than the reciprocal lattice vector can always be folded back to some value inside the reciprocal lattice vector. This is called as the reduced zone representation. We will see more about this. But what we are trying to say here is, of course, the, it, it has its energy values different. We are not talking about the energy values. What we are saying is, I take an, an electron with the k value larger than the reciprocal lattice vector, and then if I translate it to another reciprocal lattice vector, by if I translate this by reciprocal lattice vector, what the phase that I add according to the Bloch's theorem is just proportional to the phase reduced of the k value reduced by the reciprocal lattice vector, right? I suppose I have uh, conveyed this sufficiently, right? So now we have spoken about uh, the Bloch's theorem, about the, uh, the wavelength of electrons and such. The question comes, what happens at the edge of the sample? Right. So let's say I take an, uh, a sample whose unit cell is something like this. And let's say that it has n1 unit cells along x direction. It has n2 unit cells along y direction and n3 unit cells along the z direction. Right. And we previously saw that there can be some k value, there can be some waves which extend over several unit cells, something like the blue curve. right? Let's say what happens if it extends, let's say, say close to the N1 unit cells. Let's say you have these several atomic chains and you go to this N1 point. What happens after this? What happens at the edge? If the wave vector does not go back to the starting point, it will start to have reflections. Okay? So to avoid such things, we use what is called as a born one karman brownie condition, which tells us that I take a wave psi of R and I translate it by some N1 AI. So that in the sense that I go to the edge of this sample. I make the edge of the sample to have the same value at which it starts. In the sense that at the edge of the sample, I assume that I have another sample which has same characteristics which start from that particular point so that there is no reflection here. Another way to look at it, is I have this sample which exists in this large loop. So I came here, I start here, 
let's say you have the first unit cell second unit cell third unit cell and then you keep on going when you go to the n one unit cell in one direction the next unit cell you will go back to the starting point so this is used for a mathematical simplicity to say that there exists no reflection at the edges of the surfaces now let's use the block theorem again you take the psi k of r and then you translate it by a lattice vector but now not any lattice vector but this lattice vector takes you to the edge of the sample n1 a right we are now saying that it does not phase shift it gives you the same wave vector so we know that by block theorem if you translate by a lattice constant you have to have some phase shift but if you if you phase shift it to the edge of the sample or if you translate it to the edge of the sample now the phase shift is going to be one now there are only certain conditions in which the entire thing can be one and this is ni k dot a is equal to 2 pi an integer and this gives you that the smallest k value that you can have and why we are talking about the smallest k because it has to tell that we are talking about waves which are the largest right so let us take uh the sample which has n1 unit cells right so we are talking once again in one dimension so i have a huge chain of atoms which goes from 0 to n1 so this is the edge of the sample and we are talking about the smallest k so the large the wave with the largest wave function should stop at the edge of the sample and from this point it should have another wave very similar to the way it started here that's what we are trying to say the wave let's say it started at 0 at the edge of the sample it has to end at 0 and this is the wave which has the largest wave vector that's why we are talking about the smallest k values largest wave vector should have the smallest k value right so now if we go by this the smallest k value will turn out to be 2 pi b1 along the x direction by n1 if n1 is the number of unit cells in the uh, in the x direction right b1 is the lattice vector in the x direction so now that we understand what can be the smallest k value each of this k values so basically you have psi k is e power i k x right each of these k values determines a wave function so we call this as an orbital or it can be called as a wave functions there are several waves these are plane waves these are also called states there are several ways to mention this psi and this psi is uniquely determined by this k value right so what we are trying to see is how many orbitals how many states how many wave functions can you have as you start increasing the dimensions this is what we will deal with now right so once again we are talking about uh, a free electron by the way how do we convert a free electron to an electron in a weak periodic potential we just multiply it by uk okay and this uk should have the periodicity of the lattice this is what we saw from bloch's theorem but let us right now consider only free electrons so this psi k is e power i k x and the energy values are parabolic this is called as a dispersion relation right so e k is uh, h bar square k square it comes about if you substitute this in the schrodinger's equation you give you get this equations and we just now proved if there are n cells n1 cells along the x axis then you should have n1 independent states how do you get this because the smallest k value that you can have is 2 pi b1 by n1 right and the first reciprocal lattice vector is b1 so you must totally have b1 by n1 being the smallest point the total number of points that you will have will be n1 points right you take this b1 let us take in one dimension this is the kx axis the first reciprocal lattice vector is here this is let's say b1 and you have each one of them by 2 pi by n1 into b1 right so totally you have n1 points right now let us take some k value here and at this point i add a length dk 
how many states do I add? This is what is the question by the density of states. At any point k, if I add an, a, a length dk, how many states do I add? How do I get that? I just take dk and divide by the resolution of k that I have, which is 2 pi by a n1. It is 2 pi into b, right? Or you can write 2 pi by a. Either way, it's the same. Right? N1 is the number of atoms in this unit cell. But it is not just this. You see that the energy or uh, is, is square of K, right? So you can have positive moving electrons as well as negative moving electrons. You have plus K and you have minus Kx. Let's take some K at both places and add DK here. You add DK here. The total number of states that you add or total number of wave functions that you add is twice dk divided by the resolution 2 pi by a n1. Right? So the total number of states dg here I represented by capital G, dg is twice dk but then typically we always talk about number of states per unit energy. This is just by convention, there is no reason why we should stick to this but just by convention we talk about number of states per unit energy. We spoke about dk here, so now we can convert dk to de by differentiating the energy equation here. I substitute and I I bring the, so let's say a n1 is the total length of the sample in one dimension, right? a is the lattice constant into n1 is the number of unit cells, a into n1 will give me the length of this 1D uh, string of atoms. If I bring it below, dg by uh, d by l this is the number of states per unit energy per unit length it comes out to this equation which depends upon the mass of the electron and is inversely proportional to the energy so basically it is 1 by rho t what it tells is the density of states the number of electrons that you can have decreases as the energy increases so at very high energy levels, you have very small density of states. You can have very few number of electrons here, whereas you can have a lot of electrons here. So the density of states dg by de by l is plotted in the blue line here. It diverges at very small energies and almost vanishes at higher energies. So what it means is if I have 1D string of atoms, most of my electrons will stay at low energies and very few of them will stay at high energies. This has to do with the parabolic dispersion here, right? Uh, this does not really depict a parabolic dispersion. It typically is like this. So here you have a lot more K values for the same Delhi, whereas at high energies here, the, the amount of K values is much smaller than the amount of k values here. So that's why at small energies, you will have really uh, exploding density of states in 1D chain. Let's look at the same thing in 2D, right? So in 1D, let's say if we have, we talked about a chain of k here at some, let's say this is zero at some k and adding dk, in 2D, it has to be like this, right? kx, sorry, kx and ky. And this k instead of one segment now will be a, uh, a disk. And this dk that we add is going to add additional states like this. So what we will have the additional amount of area that you will, that you will cover by, uh, by, by having this uh, extra state is basically dk divided by the resolution. 2 pi k, right? So 2 pi k dk is the additional area that you will add by taking a small step dk, right? When you have a disk. So here you have 2 pi k dk divided by the resolution. Resolution here in each dimension is basically 2 pi by a n1 into 2 pi by a n2, right? a1, a2. So basically you will have 4 pi square by a1 by a2 into n1 by n2. This is the resolution of case divided by the total area that you will add if you take dk in each dimension. 
Once again, we follow the same route, but here if you see the total density of states per unit area will turn out to be m by pi h bar square, which is constant in energy. So in two dimensions, you have a density of states which is independent of energy. You have something which is constant. This can once again be explained by uh, the area which is swept, right? So in, in two dimensions, basically you have a parabola, right? Something which goes like this. So maybe I'm not drawing it well. It comes like this. So all we are trying to do is to take one snapshot here, which will turn out to be independent of the K value. Right? So if you see the total energy per unit area is independent of the K value, and hence you have something which does not change with the energy in two dimensions. In three dimensions, we just tell it, let's take a look before we go there, let's take a look at what is the smallest volume that you will get in three dimensions because this is something which we will use many uh, over and above in most of the samples. In one dimension, each dimension will add 2 pi b1 by n1, right? So let's say kx is 2 pi b1 by n1, ky is 2 pi b2 by n2, and kz is 2 pi b3 by n3. If it's just a cube, it is just a multiplication of b1, b2 and b3. But then if you do not represent a cube for a generalized situation, the total volume is b1 dot b2 into b3. And you multiply both the constants together, 8 pi q by n1, n2, n3. n1, n2, n3 will give you a total number of unit cells, which is capital N here, right? So basically the smallest volume in 3D space is 8 pi cube by total number of unit cells into the volume in a reciprocal space. And volume in reciprocal space is inverse of the volume in the real space, right? Volume of the unit cell. Number of cells that you have and the multiplication by the number, by the volume in uh, volume of the unit cell in real space will give you the total volume of the sample, the L cube, capital L cube. So if I take a cubic sample, the the smallest k volume that I can have is 8 pi cube times divided by the total volume of the sample. Right? With that given, once again, we will follow the same procedure. As we did previously, if I take a small del k from a cube, what I will get is I will I have the surface area multiplied by the, uh, the extension that I will get, 4 pi k square multiplied by dk. This is the first order approximation. Of course, we will get other terms, but we are neglecting other things, right? And divided by the resolution, 8 pi cube by V that we saw previously. And if I do this, the total number of states per unit energy, per unit volume in 3D space will turn out to be 1 by 2 pi square proportional to root E, right? So if I plot the density of states versus energy. For a 1D system, I will have something like this. Right? The density of states diverges at small energy and is vanishingly small at higher energies. This is 1D. For a 2D system, I have something constant. For a 3D thing, I have which is square root of it, which goes like this. Right? So this is 3D. This is 2D and one which vanishes is 1D. So this is the density of states. Let's now take an example for, uh, let's say, uh, of gold, of volume one centimeter cube. Let's say I take a cubic gold of one centimeter cube. I know that the typical electronic density in gold is about 5.9 to 10 power 22 free electrons per centimeter square, right? We are still talking about almost free electrons. So I'm going to take the plane wave solutions, all of these things being the same. Now, the question is, what is the k value up to which everything is occupied? 
right? So let us take the smallest volume in space I know, which is eight pi cube by one centimeter cube is the smallest k volume, right? And this k can take in at max two electrons, right? So because each, each k can have electrons with two spins, we'll talk about spins soon enough, but each dk, the smallest volume can take two, um, uh, two electrons. So if we say that the state still some energy kf, f is called the Fermi wave vector, we will go there later on. Let us say some cube is filled, sorry, some sphere is filled. Why it has to be sphere and not a cube? Because we start filling the lowest energy states, right? So it has to be homogeneous and the most homogeneous volume is a sphere, right? So you take four pi by three kf cube is the volume till which it is occupied divided by the smallest resolution that we will have, right? So basically total number of states should be equal to four by three pi k cube divided by the volume, which is eight pi cube by uh, one centimeter square, right? One centimeter cube. Should give you the total number of electrons per centimeter cube. However, we each k can give us uh, two electrons, right? So it also turns out to be two. If I take this n to be equal to 5.9 into 10 power 22, if I substitute this, I get a wave vector lambda to be equal to 5.21 angstroms. So what it, what it means is the largest kf, the kf largest wave vector which is filled has a value which is dangerously close to the first reciprocal lattice point. So what do I mean? I'm going to draw this in a in one dimension, just for us to understand. Let's say this is some k dimension. And this is the first reciprocal lattice vector B. And this is the smallest energy and then you keep populating it by adding more and more electrons, right? And for the total density of electrons we have, the electron which is the most occupied comes to be very close to the to the first reciprocal lattice point. The KF comes really, really close to the reciprocal lattice point. And we know that when the, when the electron comes very close to the reciprocal lattice point, its wave vectors are much, are, are similar to the interatomic distance, right? So basically I have electrons like this and the electron at KF has a wave vector, something like this, very close to the interatomic system. An electron which is larger than KF will have a wave vector smaller, right? Electron which is somewhere here will have wave vector which is larger. I hope that is clear now, right? So very close to KF, we are saying that we have electrons which have uh, wave vectors close to the interatomic space. So now what happens to electrons who wave vector are very close to the interatomic space? You have what is called as Bragg's reflection. And these are things that will be discussed the next time we meet. Okay, so this is what we have, we have spoken about. The electron, which is the blue electron should have a wave vector like this, right? The red one has energies very close to the interatomic space and the black one should be smaller. And we saw that the red one KF is very close to the Fermi, uh, Fermi level and the black one is, is K greater than KF. This is K much smaller, smaller than KF, right? So with this, we will stop today's lecture and uh, let's talk about this the next time we meet. Thank you.